Hello there and welcome. We are so glad to have you here at the Nonprofit Show. Today we are thrilled to have with us Angela D. Barnes. She is the Interim Vice Chancellor at Indiana University East. Thrilled for you to bring this subject matter to us, Angela, because you're going to talk to us about cost benefit and analysis that needs to happen when it comes to building your case. So before we bring you into conversation, we want to remind all of our amazing viewers and listeners, whether you are you know, joining us for the first time or you're a loyal, dedicated viewer, thank you. Julia Patrick is here. Julia is the CEO <laughs> of the American Nonprofit Academy. This is her brainchild. She literally <laughs> thought and told me, this is how she roped me in, that it was going to be a two-week endeavor. And here we are four plus years into this <laughs> two-week endeavor. And that's um, what gave here. me my white hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's been worth it. I'm Jarrett Ransom, co-host, but nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. Truly amazed by our guest conversations that we have. Uh, so no pressure, Angela, but truly, we are always amazed by, you know, the conversations that, that come on the show because they've changed. We talk about mm -hmm. all things nonprofit. And while we thought we would run out of topics, we don't right. because the topics evolve and mm -hmm. the conversations evolve. But we must say thank you to our amazing presenting sponsors. These are the companies that lean into us and lean into you ultimately for your mission. So thank you to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University. Also thank you to Nonprofit Thought Leader, you're not your part-time controller, nonprofit tech talk, nonprofit nerd, as well as staffing boutique. So again, many of these companies truly have been with us since March of 2020. Um, also signed up for that two-week journey, right? Which is now four years in the making, coming up on 900 episodes. So if you've joined us before, you've heard me tout 900 because that is a heck of a lot of conversations, but we do this for you. And again, thank you to our sponsors. If you missed any of those episodes or, you know, Angela says this amazing, you know, inspirational thought piece today, and you want to go back and listen to it, we have you covered my friends. So you can scan the QR code right now, if you're watching and you can download the app. And in just a matter of hours, you'll get a notification that the broadcast has now been uploaded onto that platform. We're still on the streaming broadcast as well as podcast. So wherever you choose to consume your information, uh, please do check out the nonprofit show because we're there free of charge with plenty of information for your consumption. That was a lot for the startup, but again, all of this to really welcome you, Angela, because we are just, I'm honored to have you here. Angela D. Barnes, MBA, CFRE, and then also your title here we have as Interim Vice Chancellor at Indiana University East. Welcome to you. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, Jared, you and I actually met in person back at Cultivate uh, 2023, the inaugural event uh, that uh, kicked off everything in San Diego. So it is quite the honor to be on your show a couple months later. <laughs> Well, thrilled to have that. Yes, thank you. Fundraising Academy has been a wonderful partner. Mm -hmm. Each and every week we have a representative uh, from that team. So I meet amazing people at these conferences. So glad that the nonprofit show is back on the road, so to speak, to meet people like you, to bring you know conversations to the forefront. And this one we're talking about today is I'm going to say a whopper because I don't think we talk about it enough, but moreover, talk about it. I don't think we do enough about it. So let's, let's dive deep. I am looking forward to learning, you know, with you and from you, but let's get started here on what it takes to analyze how you and your team, how they spend their time. What does this look like? And, and what are you seeing? So this is an interesting assignment when you give your team this and even give yourself this task, Jared, to sit down and analyze how you spend your time. So this, this simple task has met with a lot of anxiety when I've given this out and I've said to people, you know, um, list how you spend your time. You can start by project mm -hmm. and list the tasks of the project 
mm-hmm. on a daily basis, and then approximately how many hours you spend on that time. Another good way to approach this, we might talk about this later on in, in this deck, is by your calendar. I don't know about you, but I put everything on my calendar. Mm-hmm. Okay. And especially all the meetings. Look at all of the time you are spending on meetings and then divide that up as to whether or not that's your scope of work or it's for the company or the organization you work for. But Um, analyzing that is important. I love that you said that to, to really quantify what it is that the intent of that meeting is for. Because we don't always think of it that way, do we? No, no. We, um, you know, in this, in this industry, we are people pleasers at times. So we don't say no. And this, this exercise right here helps you understand why you should say no. And then you can formulate the no before you are asked. Okay. (laughs) Because it's coming down the pike. Someone's going to ask you to do something that is not within the scope of work that either you do or you do not have time for. Right. And those are intense findings. So then let me ask you this. If that's the case and you have people saying, yeah, but we need to meet because we need to make some decisions. What is that next thing? Is it like, well, put it to me in an email and I'll respond? Or how do we how do we navigate the results that a meeting is supposedly going to bring us? Well, we talked about this a little bit of uh, with a, um, a class I was attending for CFREs who are studying to obtain their CFREs. And it was on, on a similar similar um, vein, Julia. Um, board of trustees are, are telling me that they want me to do X, Y, Z. And they keep bringing up suggestions on how to fundraise. And I don't know how to make them stop. Mm-hmm. And I explained to them the reason why you are getting those requests is because you do not have a plan in place. When you have a plan in place and you have you have um, gathered everybody's information and opinions to formulate that plan, then you roll out that plan and that's all you talk about. All of those suggestions kind of magically disappear. So in the same mm-hmm. sense with your question, with and, I, and I've had this happen over and over again. The same thing with your line of questioning, um, Julia, which is great. When you have a plan in place, you can show this is what I'm working on. This is what I need to continue on. This is the next step. This is my milestone I need to hit next week. All of that goes away because people understand where you are in your own process because you have created your own process. And it starts with the task uh, manager of figuring out how you spend your time. Yeah. Okay, that's that's fascinating. I would have never I would have never aligned that action to workflow. That's yes. fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah. Jared, that's, I interrupted uh-huh. you, but I was like so I was like, I have to know the answer to this, so I apologize. <laughs> Say, you know, Angela, I mentioned when we started this that I don't think we talk about it enough, but I really don't think we look into this and do the work it takes to to find that cost analysis. Truly, the only one time I have really seen this, sorry, twice, I've seen this work, but usually it's around um, grant management, right? And so it's mm-hmm. having staff essentially track their hours and their timesheet based upon what project they're working on, whether it's program. But really, this is an account, I've seen it as an accounting measure to report accurately to funders. So that's really my own expertise in this area. Wow. And, and that's a, a good call out, Jared. You're spot on. Another area that I've seen this used that has been very effective is in events. Should right. we continue to do this events? And because we're not looking at the true cost, that includes labor. Mm-hmm. Labor expands that, re- it shrinks your return on investment quickly, totally. just quickly. Right. And I'll take a salary person and divide up their hours over a 1,960 hour year. That's it's normally 2,080 hours, but you strip out two weeks for vacation, one week for kind of PTO and things like that. And then you look and see along with the tasks that they've, they've given you and the hours that they've given you, you compare that to the hours that they should spend. One time I, I found uh, an individual and it, this was really kind of career saving for her. She had spent over 700 hours a year on an event 
Um, so, so she had spent over over. She went over the one thousand nine hundred and sixty hour mark. She was over by seven hundred hours. We found out why that was happening was because she was spending time on an event. Seventy two percent of her time, Jared and Julia, mm. went to an event that raised point five percent of the annual goal. Mm. That's her. Now, it was, and so she because she couldn't prove the case. Mm-hmm. That it was the event was worth canceling. Right. Now she had the data to say to leadership, I don't think this is a good use of my time. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that takes courage and bravery, right? Okay. Like I, I think, I mean, first of all, having the data, absolutely. So let's move on to, you know, for this example in particular, she reviewed the daily task tasks and really looked at this cost benefit time analysis. Mm-hmm. I remember when I started my career many moons ago, <laughs> I would not have had the courage to say that, right? I would have said basically people pleasing, whatever you need, I'm here to do it because that falls under all other duties as assigned. <laughs> right. That that's a that's a weird yes. You see that on every um role description. Right. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the junk drawer in the kitchen, you know, in everyone's kitchen. It's kind of like, that's where everything else falls. Okay. So talk to us then Angela about, you know, reviewing our task and then looking at this cost benefit time analysis. So being as honest as a person can be about the task, that's where it starts. It starts. If you are spending time uh, doing ancillary things that do, that are out of the scope of work or out of the the project scope of work. This is extremely effective too if you're a consultant. Okay. Yeah. Write those down. Put them, I put them on a spreadsheet. And then I group them according to project. This is what I this is what I do for this project. This is what I do for this project or this program. Then I start looking at approximately how many hours I spend on that. Even if it's it's, it's 30 minute increments, those add up. Mm-hmm. Next, you. I look at it per month. Okay. And then once I put those on paper, I have, and I, 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 I add, that's when I start massaging the data. Mm-hmm. Okay. I start looking at it and, and start figuring out the themes and where time is going, what aligns with the scope, this person's scope of work mm-hmm. versus what aligns with, um, an, a hidden agenda somewhere within the organization. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those hidden agendas happen all the time. Yeah. Um, or and it's and, and and sometimes or or one person's request at a higher level, okay. Um, this particular, the particular example I gave you was going against an ex council person's request. Right. All right. So this was a tough one, but we got through it, and that person felt better because they weren't standing up for themselves; they were standing up for the data. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. We talk often about. Data is sexy, right? Data, data, but data is sexy. And so I love that she was then equipped to say, look, I'm, I'm showing the data. This is the data. You're, you're right, J- Jared. Data is sexy. Data is needed. And data can save your career. Okay. Because if you're stuck at this level because you're doing these tasks, now you have the opportunity to elevate. Mm-hmm. All right. So, sorry. Okay. So Angela, are you, no, you go, you go. Cause I interrupted. Last okay, time. good. Yeah. We have so many questions as you can tell. So my question <laughs> is what if an organization does not want to implement this cost analysis, uh-huh. but an employee does, right? So, so what if the employee says, again, I would like to prove in data that we should not be having this event. How, how might we go about this as an individual versus an organization implementing this across the, the, the board? I would call it a task assessment. You did your own task assessment, and this is what you came up with mm-hmm. because you, you wanted to have the discussion of how to prioritize your time, how to prioritize projects, how to prioritize programming. Yeah. If you can't do it all, this is what I can do. And then you become the sad subject a, a matter expert on your time because you're standing there with the data. Okay, it's so, so devil, hard to argue data. Devil's advocate, that. will the supervisor or have you seen this then push back and say, well, how much time did you take on this task assessment? 
Have you heard that come about too? One instance and the person had did it on their own time. Mm -hmm. It was oh. and, and, and another instance where a person said, this is part of my role as managing my time. Ooh, I love that. I love that. Who, where is it not listed on a job description or within somebody's performance reviews, managing time? Right. And so that leads me to my question is, do you find that people are shocked at what, what the, what the data says that they, they're like, what I actually, this is what's happening. Cause I think a lot of times we have this narrative in our mind based on the stress of task management that we have to achieve and what we feel is important and what we feel we're good at or not good at. And then when it's all laid out, I, I've got to believe there's some inconsistencies or, or maybe some things revealed that we, we didn't intuitively recognize. I think the best way I can answer that question, Julia, is with the same example I gave you regarding a person spending 72% of their time on a 0.5, on an event that brought in 0.5% of the annual goal. This person said to me, literally, her face had just kind of collapsed. And she mm -hmm. said, it's not even a whole percentage. Yeah. I'm not that's even bringing in so a whole defeating. percentage. Yeah, that's and brutal. So, I mean, you know, I'm not even bringing in a whole percentage. It's not even a 1%, Angela. And that is where we are become motivated to understand what it would take to affect change. You know, one of the areas that we talked about in um, San Diego during Cultivate 2023 was how to influence leaders such as board members, leadership, the leadership team, those in the C-suite. And one of them is through data. Data tells, data shapes a narrative. Oftentimes the narrative doesn't align with the data. Case in point, people were told, because you know, Data comes in two elements, quantitative and qualitative. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm preaching to the choir about this. <laughs> Sometimes we have an incredible amount of quantitative data, mm -hmm. but the decision is made according to your qualitative data. What are the feelings, emotions, and perceptions around this decision? Mm -hmm. But the hardcore data shapes the soft data. Mm -hmm. All right. You need both, but one is shaping the other. Let me give an example. An event, uh, a program was being uh, was being considered and there was perceptions around the outcomes, the effectiveness of this, what this new program would do. But the data showed the opposite. So, you know how we can fall in love with our own ideas? Absolutely. Oh, data yeah. stops Every that. Every day. Data <laughs> stops that. Yeah. Data right. says no. Well, we, you know, um, we found out uh, all our, our our alums love going to this event. Actually, three out of 300 people are actual alums <laughs> that attend this event. I thought it was more. Here is here. Here's the data. Right. OK, right. so it's it's those kind of conversations that sometimes are challenging. But boy, are they worth it? If there's ever a time to take a leap, it's because data is 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 under your wings. You can fly on data. You can't fly on anything else. I'll tell you that. Well, a hope and a prayer. Well, talk to us about realigning now. So we're going to use the data and we're going to realign then some of our or all of our daily tasks for you know those stated goals. How does this take place? Right. How do we go into a new direction? Like I think a lot of times we look at the data and we're like, okay, this isn't working, but that doesn't answer the question of, well, what will work, right? So mm -hmm. how do we how do we get there? Because I think a lot of times we just keep doing what is supposedly comfortable, right? We do what we did last year. Yeah, yeah. We do what we do last year. What did we do last year? Okay, let's take out that blueprint. <laughs> the fear, there's a fear in creating a new blueprint. Right, right. Okay. What if so it doesn't work? Yeah. What if I'm wrong? What if I don't know? You know, um, imposter syndrome all of a sudden pops up and says that you're not a subject matter expert on your job. <laughs> then who is? I mean, I don't understand. <laughs> so, so how to realign data, how to realign your daily tasks, um, taking out your scope of work, your job description, um, things like that. It's helpful and aligning that with what you've been doing and seeing where there's inconsistencies. 
-hmm. because if somebody, my thing is do your own audit or one will be done on you. All right. Do your own audit on your department or one will be done. It's up to you. You know, if you come into this, to this area and I can hand you a task assessment thing, then here you are. <laughs> Let me know if you if you find anything different. Maybe they'll tell you something different. So do you, for, first of all, perform your own audit. And this is, this is, we're just saying a really cute way of calling this an audit at times. Um, you know, look at what you've been working on after you've looked at your jobs and your job description and your role. And then align it with the outcomes you've been receiving. Mm -hmm. Data doesn't lie. Yeah. You had mentioned a spreadsheet. So is this Excel? I mean, any kind of a basic spreadsheet? How do we go about this? Like at the at the basics? It shouldn't cost money. <laughs> it's just simply the tools you already have. Yeah. Um, there's a couple different fields in a spreadsheet, those those columns that'll help you conduct this research quickly. The first field that you would list, uh, the first column basically is the task. Mm -hmm. Make that spread, make that a big column because sometimes it takes a lot to actually explain what the heck you're doing. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what am I doing? What, what, why would I do that? And if you cannot explain it, you probably shouldn't do it. That's, yeah. that's the hard and fast rule. The second field is what category is it administrative work is it actual fundraising mm. yeah. events is it event work okay is it project work is it community what category does this fall under that'll help you to group these hours in a way that makes sense to you and then the third one hours okay. hours you're spending under each task and then the fourth one recommended hours. Oh, interesting. That's a great, yeah, I love that. Cause you recommended get the hours. Yeah. That's brilliant. Angela, that's really, you brilliant. need to add or you need to delete. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think to the earlier point about how, you know, shocked we can be at what, where the day goes. I mean, we say this every day on the nonprofit show, where does the morning go? Right. You know, we're like, what happened? And so I can see that that truth to to the existence, if you will, you know, really stepping back and saying, OK, this is what occurred and this is how long it take took. Angela, I'm curious, do you recommend this is an annual assessment, a quarterly assessment? And then, you know, to double down on this question, when there's a new employee that comes out, do you recommend that they start out of the gate with their own assessment? Well, I mean, I'm just one, I, I feel super empowered, right. By the information you've provided, but now I'm a, I'm a, I'm an action taker. So I'm like, what does this look like? And how often do I need to do it? Yeah, I agree. So admittedly, I've been the one in my former life as a consultant, I've done it when there's been a problem Sure. and that's probably that induces anxiety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. It's like, oh, so why do you want to know what hours I'm working on? Because they're not adding up, you know. So <laughs> if you if you are a self-starter and you or your team would like to do this as just a basic exercise, um, I recently implemented this um, in my new role. And it was, we don't have a problem. We, the new person myself just needs insight into what we're doing every day. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So it's very simple as to what we're doing every day and then how I can help serve by helping remove things off of team members' plates right. that don't align with their passion or the scope of work that they've been tasked with. Okay. So there's, there's one, there's two ways to go about it. It's either because there's a problem, somebody's been called in, or, you know, I'd really love to see what we're all working on, how that we can bring that together and then what can we remove before people start asking us to do any more yeah and when you look at what's too much <clears throat> do you also consider what could be streamlined by way of automation simplification mm -hmm. integration right are you looking at that as well absolutely Okay. And that's when you can, you receive the ideas. They start flowing. You, they start percolating, Jared. Mm -hmm. 
okay, I see that we're spending X amount of hours across all the team members are spending X amount of hours on this. We probably should automate this because none of this aligns with the scope of work we've been tasked with. Yeah. All right. And it's easy right. to automate. So that's when the idea is, but when you don't have the data in front of you, along with the task, you, you don't know. It's like, I don't know where to start. Now I know where to start. You know, right. it's so interesting because I feel like you can embark upon this um, and it's like punitive to your pro to your point there's a problem we need to figure it out right. or it's really liberating and and everybody can get involved in it and say let's be honest let's be transparent and then let's see what's cooking right because right. i feel like we're in a new dawn um, because of the pandemic we have hybrid we have people coming back we've all learned to work with technology in a different way um, this, I feel like is the golden hour for some of these things to be taken in a more, or be embraced in a more positive light. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I mentioned self-starter because is that also not on every job description, every, every job role you see <laughs> right. out there? Right. I'm a self-starter. Okay. I'm not an engine, but let's, but if <laughs> I am, this is what I would do. I would sit down in terms of a new, a new person. I would have the data ready for a new person when they enter and say, these are some of the rabbit holes you can fall down. Mm -hmm. Too many meetings. Mm -hmm. Look out for this. Let's, let's see how we can make sure that we're building a plate that you want, you still want to eat off of in another year. Right. Okay. Right. That, because otherwise we're going to take that plate or that blueprint from last year, recreate, recreate, you know, like we're just going to repurpose. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're right. using blueprints from 1900s. If you really, if you, seriously, if you look yeah. at organizations, we're, we're using blueprints. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. it's historic. No, it's it, it's unnecessary. We need to modernize our blueprints. Are we using AI to automate some of this, Jared? Are we using? Are we bringing in other team members or other other departments, Julia, to help us with this? Why has this landed here? Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. You know, well, let's look at that. We're thrilled that you landed with us because it's been just amazing. Angela D. Barnes, uh, MBA, CFRE, the interim vice chancellor at Indiana University and the East Campus. Really exciting to get your perspective, to, to give us a way to look at things in a different light that ultimately are going to, you know, help us in so many other ways. And I, I just love your flow and, and how you address this with us. It's really been a lot of fun, Angela. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group, our nonprofit nerd. I like to call her my nonprofit nerd, but she can be your nonprofit nerd. As too. I push up my glasses, you know. That's right. I need <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> I need the tape right here on my glasses. Hey, everybody, we are here today uh, with the amazing support of our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have amazing people like Angela Barnes on with us, who, if you were on earlier, um, we met through a fundraising academy event at National University in San Diego. And so um, really exciting. And that's kind of how these things in life, you know, the serendipity of right. meeting people. Um, but just been really great. I, I think I needed to hear this message from you today on a Monday morning, uh, Angela. This was, this was good for me personally. This was really great. And I'm so delighted that you could join us. Thank you so much. Me too. Super oh, yeah. informational, very inspiring. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. It's, it's what we needed. And it turned my Monday truly into a Monier because again, empowering, because I, I really feel this as an opportunity for all of us. And we don't have to be directed with our organization to do this we can do an individual assessment for ourselves to really manage our own time, which again, truly inspirational. So Angela Barnes, thank you for turning our Monday into a mon yay. I think every day should be a yay at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you for all of you that joined us either live or on one of our recording um, 
platforms. We're so glad that you're here. And as we end every episode, we want to remind you to please stay well so you can do well. Thank you, Angela. We'll see everyone else here tomorrow. 